Welcome to St Bennet's Online. There are services in church and online every day of the week and you are welcome to attend any of those. And while social distancing is still in force and some members of the congregation are still shielding, we'll continue to offer an online Sunday service. If you are new to St Bennet's and would like to find out more, please visit our website www.stbennetschurch.org there you will also find contact details for the clergy if you'd like to get in touch. And now as we prepare to worship together, we keep a moment of silence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us call to mind and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, 
and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Much as without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other Beside me there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know, from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord of the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell out his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all people. For 
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is more to be feared than all gods. For all the gods of the nations are but idols. It is the Lord who made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Power and splendor in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, ye families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due to his name. Bring offerings and come into his court. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labour of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of people we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place where your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols, to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. I am the light of the world, says the Lord. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard the parables, they realised that Jesus was speaking about them. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? 
But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Or as the King James Bible famously puts it, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Our Gospel reading for the Sunday, the so-called tribute passage, was extremely popular among the early Christians. Look no further than the three synoptic Gospels. All of them, Matthew, Mark and Luke, make a point of reporting this curious incident. What is more, many scholars are convinced that the Apostle Paul has this saying in mind when he implores the church in Rome. Pay to all what is due to them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honour to whom honour is due. Such is the significance of the tribute passage that virtually every church father, Origen, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Augustine, to name but a few, put pen to paper and offered an interpretation of this text. Even the Gnostics, in the non-canonical Gospel of Thomas, could not help but enter the exegetical fray with their own take on the matter. In the politically turbulent world of the Roman Empire, the things which are Caesar's were a live issue, and understandably so. Amid a global pandemic, with presidential elections in the world's most powerful country looming large on the horizon, politics could not be more urgent or relevant today either. The Bible has much to say about the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. From bombarding exploitative elites with dire prophetic warnings to dispensing words of practical wisdom to those in government. The tribute passage, for its part, sets its sights on a foundational issue, namely the relationship between the things of God and the things of the emperor. In other words, it establishes an overall framework of how religion and politics slot together. It will not surprise you that through the ages, faithful Christians, in an effort to come to terms with this puzzling text, arrived at diametrically opposed conclusions. For many interpreters, ancient and modern alike, the things of God and the things of the Emperor are mutually exclusive. On this reading, Jesus, in a craftily subversive manoeuvre, defines the things of God in such a way as to exclude and nullify the things of the Emperor. The point is that everything belongs to God and nothing is the Emperor's. On the surface, of course, Jesus seems to recognise the tax, but this is nothing but a clever ploy. The original audience would have readily picked up on the strong, revolutionary undertones. The payment of tribute to Caesar was an act of disloyalty to God. The Lord, the God of Israel, was simply not in the business of compromising or striking deals with Caesar. This way of thinking about our Gospel reading 
is gaining more and more traction. This is especially the case in certain strands of post-colonial theology, which wrestles with how an oppressed minority can live with integrity under colonial domination. On the biblical front, there is strong support for this approach. For example, in defense of this interpretation, proponents can cite the Shema of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Not much room left for Caesar. I suspect that most of us, at one point or another, perhaps even now, have found this revolutionary interpretation appealing and exhilarating, particularly when Caesar fails us again and again. The second interpretive path, by contrast, holds that Jesus' statement offers a harmonious vision of the things of Caesar and the things of God. The two demands constitute parallel, complementary duties that can be carried out simultaneously. Obey the commands of the king and obey the commandments of God. The ecclesiastical and civil spheres were never intended to be in conflict. They mesh seamlessly. There is no dichotomy between God and Caesar. Historically, it is this passage that has emerged as a rallying cry for those who would keep God and politics, religion and the state entirely separate. Now, let me underscore that this line of interpretation should not be viewed as inherently anti-Christian or anti-church. On the contrary, there are weighty theological and practical reasons why you might wish to go in this direction. Many Christian groups have historically gravitated to this point of view in order to purge the church of what they regarded as unhelpful temporal distractions. For them, religion was a matter of the heart. It is union with Christ that we ought to be concerned about, not matters of law or tax. Christians had to withdraw from the rest of the world and build a separate society. For yet another group of Christians, this passage served as proof positive that it is our duty to be loyal to the government no matter what. This is God's will. I must admit that my own preferences lie with the third approach, a somewhat messy middle way that tries to escape dualistic thinking. I want to have my cake and eat it too. This interpretation upholds the things of Caesar while prioritizing the things of God. In this way, the demands of Caesar are allowed to stand, but are strongly subordinated to the demands of God. In contrast to the revolutionary readings that would leave nothing to Caesar, this third way recognizes that God mandates and works through the powers that be. We see it clearly in, Is in Isaiah's announcement that through Cyrus, God will fulfill his divine purpose to rebuild Jerusalem. God has worked through, through Caesar and will do so again. This is truly startling for Cyrus was a thoroughly pagan ruler with a hardly unblemished reputation. And yet, he became an instrument of God's good providence to be obeyed and honored. Today's governments, too, may be viewed as instruments of God's good provision to the extent that they supply health care and education and protect our lives and liberties. In fact, In the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah never ceases to intercede for the sinful and worthless rulers of the kingdom of Judah, even though God himself tells him to stop. But this middle way also differs radically 
from the second approach, whereby God and Caesar belong to parallel realms. The truth is that even if we agree that the separation between church and state is a good thing, which I certainly think it is, that can never mean simply that there is one sphere, the church, where God rules, and another sphere, politics, which God surrenders to Caesar. As Isaiah reminds us, I am the Lord and there is no other. It is perhaps tempting for us to see Christianity as a private form of spirituality. It may be comfortable to see the church as a weekend club we attend at our convenience. But we must never lose sight of the fact that the Christian faith makes sweeping claims and far-reaching demands, often of a political nature. To divide life between the empire and God is too easy, too neat. So the words of Jesus that we have heard today are, as always, profoundly challenging. So much so that the Herodians and the Pharisees were amazed, we're told. If it seems easy to us to give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's, then we're probably doing it wrong. We may have grown too comfortable, too complacent and may be avoiding the real struggle. But Jesus invites us into the struggle, into the eye of the storm. He calls those who follow him to stand in the tension between God and Caesar, between our Creator and our many emperors. It is neither a safe nor comfortable place to be, but this is where Jesus is and where he bids his church to go. Amen. We affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, all things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Let us lift up our hearts and pray in faith to you. We pray for the Church across the world, giving thanks for all that unites us to Christ and to other Christians. We pray for Stephen and Dagmar, our bishops, for the clergy and people of the diocese. We ask your blessing on Anna and Olga, and on all who minister to us at St Bennet's. May we rejoice that we are made in your image, and called to live our life for you. In this world where day-to-day -day life challenges our ideals, we pray for your grace to live out our faith with integrity and honesty, as we witness to your presence and life among those whom we live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world, commending to you all who face discrimination or persecution of any kind. May we be mindful in our actions, and we pray that we would be inspired to acts of inclusion and solidarity, shaping a society where prejudice and inequality are no more. 
At this time, war, elections and the pandemic fill the world with conflict, tension and fear. We pray that your spirit would bring to all situations a renewed energy, generosity and a commitment to work for unity, bringing peace and hope for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who work in government, especially here in Cambridge. May they carry out their duties with a sense of justice and compassion. Give them the wisdom and grace to use their skill for the welfare of all, ensuring that their programmes and policies support and enrich the lives of those whom they serve. We pray too for all those with whom we share our lives. Forgive us when we fail to see the needs of people around us, and during these difficult times, help us to put aside our differences so that we may live and work together for the good of our communities and our city. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who doubt or despair, all who are surrounded by darkness, illness or pain. We pray that you would have mercy on them and that they might come into the light of your healing love. May your compassion lift up those whose spirits are weary. Bless all medical staff and all engaged in the work of healing, giving them confidence in your power to restore health and strength. In a moment of silence, we hold before you all who are on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that all the departed may be gathered into your kingdom, and so we ask your grace and mercy for those who have recently died, for our own departed loved ones, and for all who have died unloved and unmourned, and for those whose year's mind falls this week, among them Charles Shering, Ernest Stephen Robertson, Hilary Bagshaw, Thomas Whitby, Brother Barnabas, SSF, and Judith McFarlane. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Joining our prayers with those of Our Lady Mary, St Benedict, and all the saints, we commend ourselves and the whole of creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Holy. You are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of Our Lady Mary, St. Benedict and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. I invite you now to make an act of spiritual communion using one or more of the following prayers. Let us pray. Holy and blessed God, you have fed us with the body and blood of your Son and filled us with your Holy Spirit. May we honour you, not only with our lips, but in lives dedicated to the service of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
be with you. And also with you. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you.